Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this, e this afternoon's NAC at Home program. I'm Mitch Case, I'm with the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public. This includes exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings, and more. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or search National Arts Club on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. If you are interested in becoming a member of the National Arts Club or would like more information, please email admissions at nationalartsclub.org. I'm now going to share an introduction from Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, chair of the club's archeology span committee. Thank you, Mitch, and good afternoon. I am Michelle Kidwell Gilbert, chair of the archeology span committee, and delighted to be speaking to you from the Grand Gallery of the National Arts Club, where we have an amazing members art show on view. I wish to welcome today's audience joining us for a most special online lecture about Hadrian's Villa, a topic I have wanted to present since 2016. Emperor Hadrian, born near present-day Seville in 76 of the Common Era and died near Naples in 138, commissioned enduring edifices situated throughout the Roman Empire as a witness to his reign, proof of imperial power. More than that, I suggest that he desired to emulate Pericles' assertion in his magisterial funeral oration regarding the importance of leaving imperishable monuments behind as a legacy. Rather than my discussing Hadrian, which Francisco de Angelis will do, I wish to relate an extraordinary day which took place in 2016. It was a glorious June 1st. I departed for a visit to Hadrian's villa from a taxi stand located to the left of the Pantheon, which Hadrian had architects rebuild, and traveled to Tivoli, where Francisco met my husband and myself at the entrance. We sauntered about expecting capitals, communal baths, mosaics, residences for the military, and much else. Later, escorted by staff archeologists, I carefully climbed down what appeared to me to be a rocky terrain, although perhaps not to anyone else. Inspecting various structures approximately 2,000 years old. After lunching on delectable prosciutto heroes followed by fruit, the tour continued. I particularly relished going through a storeroom filled with mostly white marbles, but also fragments of diverse colors. Knowing that two splendid centers from Aphrodisius were discovered at Hadrian's Villa on view in the Capitol and Museum, I inquired if any pieces of marble could have been from that numinous town, whose 50 years of excavations the Arts Club celebrated with a grand event. It was a mesmerizing day, made all the more amazing as I was about to depart. Suddenly, muffled voices culminated in a palpable air of excitement as we all rushed in the same general direction, for some mosaics had just been unearthed. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor of Classical Art and Archaeology, Francisco de Angelis, Columbia University, who chairs their Classical Studies graduate program. He is the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, including one from the Getty Research Institute, do share in my pleasure as Francisco discusses Hadrian's Villa. Francisco, if you will. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle, uh, for, uh, for this very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you uh, uh, too for, this, uh, for the invitation uh, to talk in such a prestigious uh, venue and at the National Arts uh, Club. I'm uh, really delighted uh, to share with you today uh, some of the results uh, of the many years of field work that uh, Columbia has been uh, conducting at uh, Hadrian's Villa. Um, so without uh, further ado, uh, 
let me uh, remind you of uh, where the villa is in Tivoli, uh, some 20 miles east of Rome. Uh, and Hadrian's villa is, uh, as you can see from the screen, is just uh, one of the many uh, imperial villas, uh, of the villas owned by Roman emperors, uh, owned and constructed by Roman emperors uh, in uh, central Italy. Uh, however, it stands out uh, because of its uh, extension, uh, the inventiveness uh, of its uh, architecture, uh, inventiveness and originality that are largely due to the direct intervention of uh, Hadrian uh, himself. We know from ancient sources that uh, Hadrian uh, cared uh, very much for architecture. He understood architecture. He uh, understood it so well that he even quarreled uh, with uh, some uh, 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 of the architects that uh, worked with him. In one particular case, Apollodor of Damascus, uh, the things went so bad that in the end, uh, Apollodorus was executed by the order of Hadrian uh, because uh, he had uh, criticized uh, the emperor. Um, but the villa uh, is, uh, uh, is important uh, not only because of its uh, imperial uh, patronage, uh, it, is, uh, it stands out because of its uh, sheer extension uh, uh, in antiquity, uh, the grounds of the villa uh, covered an estimated uh, 300 uh, acres. Uh, the various buildings and uh, complexes, architectural complexes of which uh, it, it was, it consisted, uh, uh, were disseminated uh, in the landscape, uh, as you can see from the model uh, here uh, on the screen. And, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, a Roman villa uh, is uh, a countryside residence, uh, whose, uh, one of whose purposes is, of course, uh, relaxation and leisure, escape from the uh, constraints uh, of city life. Uh, but uh, when the owner, uh, the constructor of a villa is an emperor, um, work is always uh, following him. Uh, uh, wherever it goes. Uh, so Hadrian's Villa was not just a place for uh, pleasure and relaxation. It was also a center uh, for administration, uh, for imperial administration. It was a center of power. We have extant letters of uh, Hadrian, official letters that Hadrian sent to cities uh, east and west in the empire that were written uh, at the villa, were sent uh, from the villa. So we have to think of this uh, extraordinary complex uh, as a place where uh, um, different kinds uh, of activities uh, took, uh, took place. Um, and uh, another uh, important uh, thing to keep in mind uh, as, we move, uh, uh, as we move forward is that uh, Hadrian's Villa is an ancient site uh, for sure. Uh, it was uh, built uh, in the, within uh, two decades uh, uh, under the reign of Hadrian, but it continued uh, to live uh, for uh, a long time after the, uh, uh, the death of Hadrian. And we'll talk more about this uh, in the course of this uh, presentation. But uh, it also uh, is a modern site, one could argue, because uh, since its uh, rediscovery uh, in the Renaissance uh, in the late 15th century, it has been the object of attention by uh, uh, innumerable uh, scholars, uh, antiquarians, artists, uh, architects. Uh, so Adrian's Villa is an ancient site, but it is also a modern site, a, a site that played a, a crucial role uh, in uh, the development of uh, modern European and Western uh, culture. And uh, it's not just uh, antiquarians like uh, Piranesi in the 18th century, but also revolutionary architects like uh, Le Corbusier uh, in the 20th century, modernist architects uh, who uh, start their adventure uh, against uh, uh, tradition uh, at uh, Hadrian's uh, villa. And uh, for this reason, uh, objects, uh, statues, mosaics, uh, other kinds of, uh, 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 of artifacts uh, that were found at the villa uh, are to be found today uh, in museums and collections uh, throughout the world. Uh, 
from uh, Rome to, uh, to Los Angeles, as you can see here uh, on the screen. And since we're talking about Los Angeles, uh, I uh, cannot help uh, reminding you that uh, one of the most recent and one of the most impressive homages uh, to the villa and its uh, architecture and uh, its uh, that uh, is uh, spread uh, throughout the landscape is uh, Richard Meyer's uh, Getty, uh, Getty Center. Uh, so uh, all this said, uh, the, uh, there is no doubt that uh, the one of the main reasons uh, for uh, the, the fame, uh, the reputation of the villa is uh, it's, uh, it's uh, incredible, uh, incredibly sophisticated, incredibly original, uh, incredibly idiosyncratic uh, architecture. Uh, what, uh, what is missing? from uh, such, uh, 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 such a vision. Well, the people that inhabited uh, the villa, uh, a lot of attention has been uh, devoted uh, to the remains uh, proper, uh, but uh, it is still difficult for us to understand, properly to understand the villa today because uh, we uh, don't know how exactly to populate or to repop repopulate it, uh, replacing the tourists that visit it uh, today with uh, its uh, original inhabitants. Uh, and I'm not all talking only of the emperor uh, who uh, ultimately uh, spent, uh, would spend at the villa uh, only part of his uh, time, but I'm talking of the permanent residents of the villa, the members of the staff uh, of uh, the personnel that run the villa, that maintained it uh, on a day-by-day -day basis, uh, even uh, uh, when the emperor was not uh, present, uh, even after the death uh, of uh, Hadrian. Um, and in the case of uh, Hadrian's villa, we are not as fortunate as in the case of other imperial villas, like the villa in, uh, in Antium on the coast of Latium, uh, south of Rome, the villa where the Emperor Nero was born and where a festival calendar, uh, an inscribed calendar was uh, retrieved that mentioned uh, the various uh, solemnities and festivals uh, that were celebrated uh, at this villa, the Villa at Ancium in the first century uh, CE. This uh, calendar is in, in important and is uh, relevant for our purposes because in addition to the, uh, the days, the festival days, also provides a list of the uh, personnel members of the staff members that were engaged in these uh, festivals. Uh, and it's not just uh, their names uh, that we have, but also their occupations, uh, most importantly, their occupations. And uh, we can use uh, this list as a proxy to get a sense uh, of uh, what kind of uh, people would inhabit uh, Hadrian's uh, villa. So uh, for example, we find uh, a good number of artisans uh, from uh, architects and stone masons, uh, masons uh, to painters and stucco workers all the way down to uh, mosaicists and tile makers who were evidently in charge of the maintenance uh, of the buildings of uh, restoring them, uh, re, uh, refurbishing them, and so on and so forth. Uh, we also learn from this uh, list uh, that uh, there were doctors, specialists of uh, bodily well-being, uh, sport trainers, uh, the su uh, superintendents of baths, and so on and so forth. Uh, there were members of the personnel, uh, all, of which, all of whom, by the way, uh, were uh, mostly um, uh, slaves uh, or uh, freedmen or freed uh, women in charge of the furniture of the silverware um, not it won't surprise you to learn that uh, gardeners uh, are very well uh, represented uh, in uh, a list like uh, the one that you see here on the screen and of course uh, administrators uh, managers uh, superintendents especially the atriensis uh, each of whom was in charge of one specific building uh, within uh, 
uh, complex, uh, but then also bailiffs, accountants, uh, uh, ar uh, archivists, uh, and uh, so on uh, and uh, so forth. Uh, now, in the case of Hadrian's Villa, uh, we, um, oh, actually, and I forgot to say that uh, all these, uh, all these, uh, all these people, all these uh, staff members, uh, were under the supervision of a general manager, a procurator, a freedman that was uh, appointed by the emperor and reported uh, directly to, uh, to him. So uh, the, uh, this list that we know from Anson gives us an idea of the kind of micro society uh, that um, inhabited, that populated, uh, sites uh, like the imperial villas uh, at Ancyon uh, and at Hadrian's uh, at, and at uh, Tivoli. In the case of Tivoli, we are not as fortunate in terms uh, of epigraphy, but uh, we do uh, uh, have uh, the archaeology, the architecture. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the so-called hundred uh, chambers, uh, the, uh, the rooms that, are, uh, that were created uh, inside the substructions of one of the most spectacular plazas uh, of uh, the villa um, were, uh, were meant to host uh, precisely uh, subordinate uh, inhabitants uh, of the villa, slaves and uh, other uh, staff uh, members. We do have uh, some testimonies from uh, uh, inscriptions, uh, and I'm mentioning uh, only the one, the most moving one, uh, if, you, if you want. Uh, mm -hmm. The funerary uh, inscription of the nurse uh, of the Emperor Hadrian, a woman that uh, must uh, have been, uh, must have uh, started her career, so to speak, uh, as a slave uh, uh, woman in Spain where the emperor was born and then followed uh, the emperor to Italy and ended her life uh, as a free uh, woman, as a freed woman uh, in uh, Tivoli where she was commemorated uh, by, uh, uh, by her, uh, her, uh, her daughter-in-law uh, daughter uh, and uh, her uh, children. Uh, but uh, all in all, uh, we do not have the same uh, amount of detail uh, for Hadrian's Villa that we have for uh, a place like Ansin. So the main source of information uh, uh, about the inhabitants uh, of uh, the villa uh, is uh, not simply architecture, but uh, archaeology, excavation. It was, it was uh, precisely in order to uh, learn more about uh, this uh, micro society uh, of uh, Hadrian's Villa that uh, together with uh, Marco Mayuro, a colleague from the University of Rome, uh, with uh, the permission uh, of the uh, local uh, authorities uh, and with uh, the support uh, of uh, our uh, institutions, uh, Columbia at New York and uh, La Sapienza in Rome, uh, we started a program that uh, uh, has allowed us to, <coughs> sorry, uh, to uh, bring uh, and train uh, American and international students uh, to uh, Hadrian's Villa over the course uh, of uh, uh, six years. We started in uh, 2014 uh, and uh, uh, over these years, uh, we uh, have uh, been uh, training uh, students both in archaeological techniques uh, and uh, in, through excavation, but also through uh, on-site uh, seminars. Uh, uh, we put up a very intensive uh, summer program uh, that, has, uh, um, uh, that has been run by us with the help uh, of uh, number of uh, team members and collaborators, uh, specialists, uh, but also former students uh, who uh, advanced uh, uh, thanks to, uh, to their, uh, um, their uh, continual engagement uh, with uh, the program. So uh, uh, we have been able to bring uh, over 200 uh, students uh, to the site uh, in the course of the first uh, five years. Uh, some of them uh, 
have been coming back again and again, a year after year. And the last year of excavation uh, was in 2019. Uh, we had plan already planned uh, our, uh, uh, our next campaign for 2020 when the pandemic hit. Uh, so we had uh, to pause, uh, but uh, we are firmly determined uh, to get back uh, to Aden's Villa to bring students back there as soon as this uh, tragedy is over and as soon as uh, international travel uh, uh, will be uh, permitted uh, again. Uh, of course, archaeology is not the only reason uh, that attracts students to the site. Uh, food, uh, uh, pantagruelic dinners, in fact, uh, are another uh, uh, strong motivator, uh, both for students uh, and for us and for any guests uh, that uh, comes and visit us. Uh, so if you happen to uh, pass by Tivoli uh, in, uh, in June, uh, do, uh, uh, do look out for us and uh, you will uh, get a tour of the villa and an invitation for dinner uh, at, uh, at the same uh, time. Um, before I... Uh, uh, transition to a presentation of the findings proper, I also like to acknowledge and uh, thank uh, the sponsors uh, that have supported our project uh, throughout uh, these years, uh, uh, without whose generosity we would not have been able to, um, uh, uh, to achieve the results uh, that I'm going to uh, present uh, to you today. So the Areta Foundation, the Ruben Ladd Foundation, the Jackman Foundation, Grace Johnson, David Sussman, as well as uh, two anonymous donors uh, who have been extremely uh, supportive uh, and, uh, and close uh, to us uh, for all these uh, years. Uh, so warm thanks uh, to uh, all of them and uh, if any of you uh, were interested in supporting uh, us and supporting uh, students, uh, do not hesitate to get in touch uh, with me. So uh, what I'm going to present uh, to you today is of course a selection of uh, the, uh, uh, the findings and the results uh, of the several campaigns that we conducted uh, in the Hadrian's Villa. And I will focus on uh, one area in particular, the so-called macchiozzo, a word, a word uh, that in Italian means thicket, because that is what it looked like when uh, we started uh, our uh, project in uh, 2014, as you can see on the right-hand side uh, of the screen. And the macchiozzo uh, was uh, attracted us because even though it looked empty, empty uh, on, the, uh, on the plants, uh, on the current plants, uh, and full of uh, vegetation only uh, when we uh, uh, went to survey the place uh, in, uh, in person. Um, it was uh, an intriguing uh, area. Uh, on the one hand, because it was uh, surrounded by buildings like the so-called Winter Palace, the Hall of the Doric Pillars, the so-called Piazza d'Oro, some of the most iconic and most important ceremonial, uh, ceremonial and uh, uh, reception uh, spaces uh, of the villa. Uh, but it also intrigued us because on 18th century plans, uh, um, scholars like Piranesi had entered uh, the uh, indications of uh, what seemed to be remains uh, of, uh, of walls. Uh, so we decided that uh, um, we, uh, the, this area, this, this uh, area that uh, is placed at the very core, uh, of, uh, at the very center uh, of the villa, deserved uh, further investigation. And as a matter of fact, uh, our, uh, our hypothesis uh, were rewarded because uh, in the course of these past years, we have been able to identify at least three buildings, three major buildings uh, that um, uh, uh, were, uh, were originally uh, uh, placed uh, here and uh, which have been uh, damaged to a greater or lesser extent uh, in the late Middle Ages uh, and, and the early modern uh, period. Uh, so, uh, in some cases, uh, only the foundations uh, are extant. In other cases, as we will see, uh, the walls are preserved to, uh, uh, to, a, greater, uh, to a greater 
extent. Um, but uh, what is important to uh, underscore in the first place to begin with is the fact that this area here is not an empty area, it's not a garden area, but uh, it, is a, a, it is a sort of a block uh, of residential units, a, a sort of a neighborhood, uh, a, a, repl a replica, a replication of an urban neighborhood or a quasi-urban neighborhood within uh, the villa, within the villa of the emperor uh, Adrian. Um, and I will, um, uh, in the following, I will uh, explain a little bit more uh, what, uh, uh, what I mean by this and what the consequences uh, of uh, this uh, uh, state uh, uh, of affairs is, uh, or, or, uh, or what the consequences uh, are. So three buildings, the so-called Medianum building, and then uh, two cordial uh, buildings. Uh, and we will, uh, I will start with uh, the Medianum uh, building, which is a, a building a rectangular in shape, uh, 22 meters by uh, 11 uh, meters, um, which, uh, whose facade, uh, uh, which is uh, this part here, uh, so here uh, on the plan, uh, has been almost completely uh, raised uh, in the late uh, medieval period, uh, but whose walls uh, uh, are uh, preserved uh, to a height uh, of up to uh, 1.8 uh, 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 meters uh, in, uh, towards, uh, towards the back. Uh, a medianum building. What is a medianum building? A medianum building is a building that is characterized by uh, uh, an, uh, an elongated uh, uh, atrium, uh, uh, elongated uh, um, room uh, that is also the vestibule functions both as a vestibule uh, of the building and as uh, literally as mediator between the entrance between the door and the various uh, other rooms of the building that open uh, onto it. What is uh, what is interesting about uh, a, a medianum building? Well, first of all, uh, the, the fact that it is a residential building. It is a, uh, uh, it is a house, it is a, a house uh, that, uh, um, or a kind of house that uh, became popular in the course of the second century CE. Uh, it is also remarkable insofar as it differs very clearly from the traditional Roman house, the canonical Pompeian house, uh, the domus uh, with the atrium and the peristyle as we know it uh, so well from uh, the Vesuvian, uh, from the Vesuvian cities. So a medianum building is a different uh, kind of house, uh, which is not attested in Pompeii and is instead uh, mainly attested, mainly known, or was known until our discovery, mainly from the harbor town of Rome, uh, uh, namely Ostia, where uh, dozens uh, of medianum buildings uh, have been uh, excavated uh, in the course of the past, uh, of the past uh, century. And uh, this finding is in and of itself interesting because uh, uh, Ostia uh, experiences an urbanistic boom in exactly the same decades, uh, the 120s, 130s, uh, when uh, Hadrian's villa is being uh, built. Uh, and uh, it is interesting to see that uh, the, the same innovative kind of residential typology is attested not only at Ostia, but also, but also at uh, the villa. And uh, the question now arises as to who was the innovator, who invented this new, uh, this new residential typology, this new kind of house that differed uh, from uh, traditional houses like the ones that we know from uh, Pompeii. Uh, it's tempting to attribute uh, such an innovation to the emperor himself. Uh, uh, of course, this is mere speculation. Uh, what we can uh, uh, s start saying, however, is that uh, it must have been architects that were uh, uh, in the circle of the emperor, for the emperor, that uh, 
Latin as have been uh, among the protagonists of this kind of innovations. Um, and uh, the parallel is important also because it allows us to get a better sense uh, of the original appearance uh, of our building at Vivian's Villa. Because uh, in Ostia, we have uh, Medianum buildings that are very close in plan uh, to that, uh, that we excavated at the Macchiozzo and are preserved uh, almost in their uh, entirety. So here you have a, you get a sense of what the facade uh, of, of, the, of a Medianum building would uh, uh, look like and uh, how, what you can uh, mentally integrate the facade uh, of the Macchiozzo uh, building. Uh, you get a sense of what the interior uh, would look like, uh, starting with the Medianum area uh, itself. Uh, and uh, you also uh, can uh, reconstruct uh, the uh, layout, uh, the general layout of the rooms, the, the spatial relationship uh, between um, uh, front rooms and back rooms uh, that were connected through doors and, uh, and windows, uh, both in Ostia and uh, at uh, Hadrian's, uh, Hadrian's Villa. But it's not just uh, the Medianum building that uh, shows uh, uh, parallels with Ostia. Also the two courtyard buildings that we excavated have uh, their best uh, comparisons uh, in similar buildings uh, in Ostia. Again, buildings that are better preserved uh, uh, the, uh, the courtyard buildings of the, of the Macchiozzo of Hadrian's Villa have been uh, again, uh, uh, almost completely uh, raised down, or the walls uh, are uh, preserved only in their lowest uh, courses. Uh, but uh, a house like the House of the Muses in Austria allows us to reconstruct uh, and reimagine the appearance of uh, the courtyard buildings uh, that, um, that have been excavated. In the, Typology is again a typology that is uh, not the orthodox uh, one that we're accustomed to from uh, Pompeii, but uh, yet another variation uh, on uh, or another innovation uh, in the field of uh, residential uh, architecture. And uh, what is interesting about our case is that uh, uh, we found not just one, but two uh, very, very close uh, cordial buildings and uh, the second one uh, we uh, have not uh, excavated uh, in its entirety. Uh, actually, we've only excavated its uh, south front, as you uh, can see on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, but we have been able to document it and to measure it. And what is interesting about it is the fact that its measurements or measurements of its room coincide uh, almost exactly with the measurements of the other project. And this uh, uh, this is important because it shows that uh, these buildings have been conceived, designed, and, uh, uh, and built according to a modular principle. Something that uh, we do not usually associate with uh, Hadrian's Villa, uh, which is known for the uniqueness and originality of its architecture. So the idea of uh, buildings uh, or building typology that is repeated uh, in uh, uh, almost the same fashion uh, 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 at, at, at the site uh, is, is something uh, quite new, but it also shows that uh, the planners uh, of the villa uh, were, uh, were mindful of recent or contemporary uh, experiments that were taking place uh, in uh, cities like uh, Ostia where we find uh, similar examples of modularly conceived uh, uh, apartments, uh, like in this case, the Medianum apartments uh, of the so-called uh, garden house uh, complex uh, that, uh, uh, that, are, uh, that, that uh, betray uh, uh, or, or, or are the testimony of uh, a very uh, lively uh, season for architectural thinking that uh, uh, involves not simply uh, the grandiose, magnificent uh, architecture of the uh, imperial reception halls and uh, audience spaces and so, so forth, but also more um, uh, is also uh, is also um, concerned with uh, concerns itself. Uh, 
with a more mundane, more, uh, more quotidian uh, uh, aspects of architecture, like uh, residential, uh, uh, residential buildings uh, that, uh, uh, that, were, uh, that were produced uh, according to uh, modular principles. And as a matter of fact, uh, this shouldn't surprise us because uh, once we start looking around uh, at Edwin's villa, we find many other buildings that are often uh, um, under or overlooked uh, in scholarly literature that uh, look like urban buildings and have their parallels uh, both in Ostia, as in this case, uh, or in Rome itself, uh, as in the case of this uh, uh, virtually, vertically conceived uh, substructions that also function as uh, storage spaces. Um, and uh, this is uh, also... Uh, uh, I mean, not to forget that uh, uh, baths, uh, this quintessential uh, um, typology of urban architecture are also to be found uh, at the villa. So the question arises, for whom were these residential uh, buildings at the Macchiozzo, uh, these innovative residential buildings at the Macchiozzo uh, conceived? For whom had they been uh, built? Um, well, uh, one... Th uh, one answer, the first part of the answer comes from an exam of the surroundings of the Macchiozzo and especially of the access patterns. Uh, there is in fact a, a tunnel that leads from the main vestibule of the villa uh, underground uh, along the large baths and emerges uh, with a monumental staircase immediately to the west uh, of uh, the Macchiozzo uh, area. Now, underground tunnels are uh, uh, paths that are meant uh, to, to be uh, used not by the emperor, not by his uh, uh, esteemed and prestigious guests, but by the personnel of the villa. So um, by the slaves, by the servants, by the administrators, uh, by those uh, who uh, are not supposed to be seen as they move from one part of the villa to, uh, to the other. Uh, and so uh, it is fair to surmise that uh, the Macchiozzo is a place that, uh, um, or that these buildings are meant uh, to serve the residential needs uh, of the personnel of the villa. But we have seen before with the example of Antium, uh, that uh, the personnel of the villa is itself uh, uh, hierarchically constituted. Uh, there are uh, overseers, uh, there are superintendents, uh, and then there are, there is, uh, sub there are subordinate uh, staff uh, members. So uh, which uh, layer of this micro society should we think of uh, in the case of our buildings? Well, in this case, it is uh, uh, the uh, decoration, the decorative patterns of uh, the buildings that have been excavated that uh, provide a clue. Uh, the mosaic floors, for example, uh, um, mosaic uh, floors uh, create uh, hierarchies uh, simply by virtue of their uh, major or minor degree of complexity and sophistication, as you can see here on the screen. Uh, where the front room of the Medianum building is clearly uh, the more important one and receives uh, a mosaic floor that is much more, uh, uh, much more intricate uh, than the rather simple geometric floor of the back room. Um, and uh, this kind of uh, hierarchical thinking uh, is, um, uh, is also visible in what is probably the most uh, spectacular uh, of the mosaic floors that we have been, uh, uh, that we have uncovered, uh, one that uh, decorated uh, the fourth floor of the largest room of the courtyard uh, building. Um, you see it here uh, soon after the excavation, and we immediately realized uh, its importance. Uh, so we had a team of uh, cleaners and restorers work on it, and. Uh, here is uh, the final outcome of this uh, work. And you can see uh, how, uh, uh, how, how uh, magnificent this, uh, uh, this uh, mosaic floor uh, originally was, uh, how, uh, how complex with its pattern of uh, 
stalks and vegetal volutes uh, that can come out of uh, human hands that are placed on the borders and in the corners uh, of the room. And uh, uh, this, uh, the volutes uh, are populated by birds, uh, each of which uh, belongs to a different species. Uh, here you have a hoopoe. Uh, you can see that uh, the pavimentari uh, who were at work here uh, uh, devoted a lot of care and attention to the creation of this uh, mosaic pool, which uh, I would like to uh, underscore is not a painted, uh, it's not a colored uh, floor. So uh, those kind of mosaics are uh, reserved for spaces that are used by the emperor. But among the black and white mosaics of the villa, this is definitely uh, uh, the most uh, the, the most uh, sophisticated that we have, has been uh, uncovered uh, so far. Um, so uh, we have to imagine, if not the procurator, uh, certainly one of the atrienses or some of the superintendents uh, occupying uh, the, and living in this uh, in these buildings, uh, and uh, the relatively high level uh, of prestige and of uh, high quality of the decoration of these buildings is confirmed also by the, the findings of uh, painting because uh, we have uh, 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 in the cases where the walls are extant we have been able to retrieve uh, wall paintings that we duly uh, recorded documented uh, as you can see here on the screen but uh, even more importantly uh, we have uh, found the ceiling uh, paintings, the painted ceilings that had fallen directly onto the floor in which you see here from uh, above. Uh, we have been retrieving these ceilings uh, with painstaking uh, care. Uh, and this has allowed us to uh, uh, reconstruct uh, uh, them uh, using the traces of the reeds uh, to which the plaster was attached uh, originally as, uh, the, uh, as the guidelines uh, uh, for uh, re both uh, reconstructing the way in which uh, these, uh, uh, the plaster was uh, hanging from uh, the posts uh, of, the, of the ceiling itself, as you can see here in this uh, 3D uh, reconstruction and uh, by um, uh, by using those same phrases uh, as guidelines to reassemble all the fragments uh, of the puzzle and this has allowed us uh, to uh, um, uh, not only to uh, reconstruct uh, segments uh, of these ceilings but uh, in fact the uh, we now have uh, the uh, in the entire uh, decorative scheme uh, of the ceiling of uh, room A, the, the main room uh, of, the, uh, of the Medianum building that we have been able to, uh, to visualize, as you can see here. We are currently working on the back room, room B, uh, and what I'm presenting here to you is a temporary reconstruction, that uh, provisional one that may be superseded by uh, further research, which is uh, ongoing. Um, but uh, what we found uh, uh, in our excavations is not just uh, architecture and uh, uh, its uh, decoration. Uh, we have been found in innumerable pieces, fragments uh, of uh, statues of decorative vessels. I'm showing you just one of them uh, that is being proudly displayed by Debbie Sokolowski, one of the uh, trench supervisors, uh, immediately after its retrieval. It is a statue base uh, that uh, has four paws uh, on it. And uh, it, it, it is uh, a fragment of a statue uh, that has its best parallels in a statue in Naples. Uh, it's a hunting dog. Uh, something that, uh, a theme that is not out of place at Hadrian's Villa. Uh, and uh, especially because we know that uh, Hadrian uh, loved hunting. In fact, uh, he loved it so much uh, that uh, he celebrated uh, his hunts in a famous series of roundels that were reused on the Arch of Constantine in late antiquity, where the emperor is shown uh, uh, departing for hunt, uh, hunting uh, a boar, a bear, 
and the lion and then offering sacrifices uh, to the gods after each of these uh, successful uh, enterprises. Um, I could go on and on uh, showing you uh, interesting uh, fragments and, and pieces that we have retrieved in our excavation, but I would like to conclude uh, with uh, what is uh, likely the most uh, inter interesting uh, set uh, of uh, findings, uh, coins, not, of, not because of their intrinsic value. In fact, uh, these coins are mostly small change, so they weren't worth uh, much, but this is precisely what is uh, interesting about uh, them, what makes them interesting in our eyes, because it, uh, it shows that these coins were used and lost uh, clearly by, uh, 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 by uh, people who were not necessarily rich, not the wealthiest inhabitants of the villa. So again, slaves, uh, 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 subordinate uh, personnel uh, who uh, frequented uh, this area uh, quite intensively, uh, judging by the number of coins that, we find, uh, that were found. And what is interesting, as you can see here on the screen, is that uh, is also their chronology. Most of the coins that we have been finding uh, date to the late third uh, until the late fourth uh, century CE. We have an almost complete, complete series of uh, emperors, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, and here you, on the screen, you see the latest one, uh, a coin um, minted under Emperor Arcadius in the late fourth uh, century uh, CE, uh, which shows that this area kept being used, uh, well, kept being uh, inhabited uh, uh, well after the death of Hadrian. Uh, at least 200, 250 years after the death uh, of Hadrian. Um, and uh, it is uh, again, uh, one of the, or maybe the latest object that were, uh, or the, that were found on the, uh, on the site that I would like to conclude uh, today's presentation with. And this is something that is even less, uh, uh, um, uh, how do I say, uh, more humble uh, than the coins that we've been seeing so far. It is a simple uh, uh, ceramic uh, bowl uh, uh, that has uh, stamped decoration in its interior. It is an interesting uh, piece, however, because uh, first of all, it was manufactured in Africa. So just like the coins, it shows that uh, still in the late fourth century, which is when this bowl uh, can be dated, uh, um, the villa was part of a broader, of a wider circuit of trade, commerce, exchange, an entire wide uh, network uh, of exchange. But the iconography, the, decor the figural decoration of this bowl is just as interesting. Uh, it shows uh, two scenes that are uh, juxtaposed to each other uh, at a 180 degree angle. Um, one scene shows a kneeling man uh, that uh, is uh, standing, uh, extending his uh, arm, his hand uh, to caress uh, the muzzle of uh, a ram, as you can see here. Uh, so he's characterized as uh, a shepherd, apparently. And then the other scene shows uh, a kneeling man, uh, maybe the same one, who's being threatened by a man with a sword. Now, what is interesting about this uh, bowl or this, uh, this class of artifacts uh, made in Africa in, in the late antiquity is that uh, um, it, uh, it, they are often decorated with scenes of biblical content. Uh, in fact, uh, what, I, what you see here is a bowl that is today in Boston that shows uh, 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 an, an episode uh, that looks uh, rather like uh, our own one. And it's the sacrifice of, I Abra of Isaac by Abram, uh, who's uh, being held back at the last minute uh, by the intervention of God's, uh, God himself, represented by his hand, who, uh, uh, who uh, exhorts uh, Abram to replace his son with, uh, with a ram. Now, uh, we have been uh, thinking as to whether uh, the, our bowl uh, were a variant uh, of this, uh, represented a variant of this uh, episode. Uh, but uh, it seems more likely, uh, even though further research uh, will be needed, uh, that what we are dealing here uh, with here 
is in fact a representation of the first homicide, uh, the killing of uh, Abel, a uh, shepherd, by his brother uh, Cain. So another biblical episode. If that were true, this would probably be the most ancient representation uh, uh, that we know of, uh, of uh, this uh, biblical episode. And it is uh, relevant, as you may imagine, precisely because it documents also the change, uh, uh, major cultural and religious change uh, in the habits uh, of the inhabitants of the villa, not of the, uh, not, uh, of the emperors, uh, most of whom uh, in the fourth century would uh, never set uh, foot uh, at the villa itself, but of uh, the personnel uh, that I was uh, uh, talking about and I began with. Um, so uh, you see how uh, even the most humblest uh, of artifacts uh, can yield a, a, a huge amount of information and actually in the case of Hayden's villa, almost revolutionary information about uh, the long and complex and interesting life uh, of the villa. Uh, and I hope uh, at this point uh, that you'll have enjoyed the presentation and uh, I cannot but uh, thank you for your attention and uh, invite you uh, to uh, imitate uh, Michelle's example and come visit us uh, in Tivoli uh, whenever you have uh, the opportunity. Thank you very much. Oh, what an extraordinary treat it is. Uh to visit Hadrian Villa. It is so marvelous and miraculous to see the work there. And I concur, the food is great. You've heard about the prosciutto sandwiches. In any case, I have some questions from the committee, but before I read them, I wanna just make a couple of comments. It was an absolutely brilliant talk. I thank you for it. and. Some of what you said, I think, has a certain resonance today. The differences, uh, we're so aware of class levels in our society, especially with the pandemic. The differences of the colors, where black and white was for the more general populace, and the colored designs reserved for the emperor and I guess the elite populations as well. The idea of seeing the slave quarters. That was important, and I thank you for that. It's something we're not always shown, or the interest in modular housing, which seems very contemporary. So it was a fascinating talk, and you gave us perspective, needed perspective for understanding. Now I'd like to go to my committee questions. From Lynn. From the age of 16, Alexander the Great had Aristotle as his special informant of all things Greek. Emperor Hadrian also became enamored of Greek civilization at an early age and was known as a Grecolus to the extent that he even adopted the Greek style of a beard as opposed to the previous emperors who were clean shaven. Did he have a special mentor who introduced him to Greek art and architecture? Very good question. I, I wish we knew. We, we know about, in fact, the, uh, you know, the art teachers of some of his successors. Uh, you know, we know, for example, that Marcus Aurelius uh, uh, was uh, 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 learned uh, how to paint from a, a painter called Diognetus. Uh, unfortunately, we don't. We, we do not have the same kind of information for uh, Hadrian, but there is no doubt that. Uh, some of the most important uh, artists of his uh, of his uh, time uh, mm -hmm. uh, had were in contact with uh, with him. One one thing to keep in mind is that uh, he was uh, born uh, uh, in Italica in in in, in Spain. Uh, so we do not know much about his uh, early uh, education. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, the emperor that I just mentioned, is a different case precisely because uh, he, uh, uh, you know, he uh, he already belonged to a to a to a to a, to a, to a family that had connections uh, with the imperial household. Uh, so we are better informed about uh, about him. In the case of Hadrian, uh, we unfortunately don't uh, don't know much, but we do know about his interactions with. Apollodorus of Damascus, uh, the great architect uh, mm -hmm. of the early second century uh, CE. Mm -hmm. 
when Hadrian was a young boy, um, his father, I believe, was a senator who was a cousin of Trajan. Yes. Okay. So he may have had some exposure that a more ordinary individual, even a wealthy one, would not come across. Is that feasible? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. You know, we can uh, extrapolate from what we know about uh, uh, the education of uh, Roman aristocrats uh, uh, in, the, in, in the imperial period uh, and uh, surmise that uh, Hadrian had, as I said, uh, teachers uh, that uh, would train him in, um, if not in the uh, exercise of the arts, uh, at least in, in their appreciation. Uh, uh, and uh, we cannot go much beyond that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but, um, mm -hmm. uh, but there is no doubt that uh, uh, that Hadrian uh, had uh, an, a, had an, a kind of education, a kind of uh, training that was an encompassing one uh, in, that spanned from uh, ancient literature to philosophy to uh, arts and architecture, and of course to politics. Mm -hmm. Uh, from Faye on the committee, she asked, is there a stylistic architecture wherever Hadrian built? Would you say it's classically oriented? Because I noticed that a number of the questions relate to Hadrian and his Greekophile nation. Mm -hmm. Well, what is interesting about uh, uh, the findings that I presented today is that uh, uh, there isn't much of uh, Philhellenism, uh, there isn't, uh, we, we, the, there isn't a, a very strong Greek imprint in the kind of buildings that we've been, uh, that I've been uh, presenting. So it shows how Hadrian uh, uh, truly was, uh, you know, uh, somebody who thought in holistic uh, terms. Uh, on the one hand, of course, he has, uh, uh, monuments uh, of uh, Greek, uh, of the Greek past being copied, imitated uh, mm -hmm. at the villa in, uh, in several of the places that we uh, visit uh, today. For example, the, the, the so-called temple of the Canadian uh, Aphrodite. Uh, but uh, he, he was not a purist. Uh, and in fact, this is what makes him so interesting that uh, he evidently liked to experiment. Uh, or his architects uh, did, and, and he approved of, uh, of that. Uh, so we have, uh, as is well known, also Egyptian elements uh, that are present at the villa, as well as uh, those uh, uh, components of, urb of contemporary urban architecture that I've been uh, underscoring uh, that are uh, you know, a novelty uh, in a sense. It's something that uh, uh, has never been uh, paid uh, uh, too much attention to because we didn't have uh, we didn't have uh, those uh, those buildings, uh, uh, or, or they were not had not been uncovered uh, so far. Okay. Um, thank you. Another question from Jody now on the committee. Uh, Hadrian's villa seems to have sections intact even after two thousand years. The Canoptics, the elongated pool mimicking the canal from Alexandria to Canoptus on the Nile Delta. So. I've expanded what it is for the audience, um, has a number of original statuary. Why didn't the locals during the dark ages strip it totally for building material or did they? Um, why didn't the church mutilate the pagan statuary from the site, which it did at other ancient locations or even replace them with Christian symbols as they did in the Pantheon and the Colosseum? And from what I've read, I think it was the Jesuits who were involved in Hadrian's villa. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, that's uh, uh, part of the modern story of the, of the villa. What uh, mm -hmm. we uh, surprisingly uh, don't have uh, or didn't have so far were traces of uh, 
uh, Christian presence uh, at the villa in, in late antiquity. The bowl that I've shown you with the biblical episode of Cain and Abel, if that identification is correct, uh, is the first attestation uh, of, uh, of such, a, such a presence. And uh, this is unusual because other imperial villas were in fact uh, taken over by the church uh, or by monks, by St. Benedict, for example, in uh, the Villa of Nero at Subiaco, uh, became the center of the Benedictine uh, monasteries, uh, or a cluster of, of monasteries uh, in the area. And uh, Hadrian's Villa did not experience uh, the same fate. Uh, and apparently uh, it, it just at some point was abandoned. This is something that we are just starting to understand uh, mm -hmm. thanks to our investigations. I mean, apparently in the course of the fifth and sixth century, uh, the villa fell in a state of disrepair and started to, uh, to become a ruin. However, in the Middle Ages, it was indeed subject to phenomena of spoliation. Uh, if you go and visit uh, not only Hadrian's Villa, but Tivoli and its churches uh, today, you will see that uh, many columns, marble fragments, uh, uh, architectural elements uh, have been taken from the villa and reused uh, in, uh, uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, the, in the late medieval and early modern buildings. Even the bricks uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the villa have in some cases been uh, pillaged and reused for the facade of, uh, uh, of certain uh, churches. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, there are two interesting interlocking questions, I think. Uh, one was about the fountains and the water supply, and one is about the sewer system. Yes. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I could give you another presentation about uh, the, uh, the issues that uh, the inhabitants of the Machiazza encountered with uh, water, uh, because we found uh, a series of channels, open air channels made with reused tiles uh, that uh, uh, were put in place in uh, late antiquity, even after the period uh, I've been talking about, uh, evidently because they were, they, they had problems with uh, the, the management uh, of water and, and, and rain, rainwater mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in the area. Uh, but this is also a, a, a topic for, uh, for yet another, uh, yet another talk uh, altogether because uh, uh, Hadrian's Villa, uh, just as uh, the Renaissance Villa d'Este in Tivoli uh, is uh, important also because of the waterworks, the water pools, the fountains uh, and springs, artificial springs uh, that were implanted uh, everywhere in the villa. And, uh, and of course, uh, the baths uh, also required uh, uh, steady water supply in order to function. Mm -hmm. And uh, this aspect of the villa is one that uh, uh, would require a sort of a holistic approach uh, to the site, one that uh, uh, were able to uh, follow the, uh, the, the path of the sewers uh, mm -hmm. underground. Uh, it is something that uh, I would very much like uh, to do. Uh, it is also connected with uh, the presence, uh, the, 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 the widespread presence of latrines in the villa, latrines uh, of different uh, kinds and different levels. Uh, again, Michelle, you were talking of uh, different uh, of social social distinctions, social I classes. That was very we have luxury latrines at Hadrian's Villa, uh, individual ones and uh, collective ones. Uh, so um, there, that is a whole other chapter of the uh, of the architecture and the in infrastructure of the site uh, that uh, would uh, reward uh, cl closer attention. It has been studied uh, by some scholars, but there is still a lot to do. Just to mention one thing, we still do not know uh, from which aqueduct or, uh, the uh, the villa received uh, its, uh, its its water. Uh, so it's. Uh, the, the challenge here is that we have to study not only the villa itself, but also the surroundings uh, of, the, of the villa. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the Parthenon now, which is a fairly intact building compared to what we have at Hadrian's Villa itself. And there you have the water sprouts and on the ground, you have the channel to take the water away 
from the Parthenon itself. Do you see anything analogous? Yeah. Uh, in fact, one thing, uh, one of the many things that I uh, uh, you know, left aside uh, is uh, what seems to be a, a semicircular fountain structure mm -hmm. in front of the Medianum building. So, mm -hmm. uh, in um, the Medianum building, uh, uh, which had not only the door but also uh, big windows, as, uh, as you saw, enjoyed uh, the view of this uh, fountains uh, immediately in front of it. And uh, there we have uh, found the beginning of uh, a conduit uh, that uh, led the water uh, uh, out of the um, out of the um, uh, of, of the fountain. Uh, of the fountain proper, of the water basin actually uh, proper. And in the courtyard buildings, in both courtyard buildings, we also have, uh, un uh, we have uh, uncovered uh, uh, kitchen or service areas uh, that have uh, um, rather deep uh, uh, water channels uh, uh, covered with waterproof mortar uh, that uh, uh, again, uh, uh, are connected with this broader uh, network of uh, water supply. Interesting. Um, there are a number of questions that seem to be interrelated also about artists. Um, the design of the mosaic floors. Do you think some of the designs were from one person, a collaboration that workers came in and someone remarked about the individual species of birds is astounding. I think you have some birds also in Livia's garden room, yeah. but they're really amazing. Also, um, there were questions about the architects. How did they learn designs? Were there notebooks? How did the different advances in parts of the empire travel <laughs> through Hadrian's villa? Uh, wonderful questions. I mean, about the mosaics, uh, in fact, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't show you the closest parallels that we have to the mosaics that we uncovered, but they are at Hadrian's Villa itself. Uh, there, it, 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 is another, um, uh, it is another complex, a uh, residential complex that was probably used by mm -hmm. the members, uh, the elite members of the Praetorian Guard, the bodyguard mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the emperor. And the, um, the, the bedrooms uh, of uh, these uh, soldiers uh, were all uh, uh, decorated with black and white mosaic floors, uh, some of whose uh, patterns coincide exactly with the patterns that we have, uh, that we have found uh, at, the, at the Macchiozzo. So there is no doubt that if not the same individual, the same workshop uh, was active uh, in different parts of the villa. And if we extend uh, our, or expand our focus, broaden our focus uh, to include Ostia, we have been finding uh, uh, good parallels uh, um, to uh, our patterns uh, uh, and our motifs uh, in Ostian houses as well. Uh, those parallels are not uh, so close that they allow us to talk of, uh, an, uh, mm -hmm. of an identity of workshops, uh, but they are close enough that, uh, to suggest that uh, these workshops were in conversation with each other. And this leads me to uh, the, the second question about how uh, uh, artistic architectural knowledge uh, travels. Uh, and uh, well, uh, Th this is, uh, you know, a, a, a big, a, a big question, but uh, there is no doubt that uh, uh, a place like, uh, um, uh, like um, central Italy, in mm -hmm. the under under Hadrian, was a place uh, of intense architectural thinking and intense exchange mm -hmm. of ideas among architects. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, not to forget uh, that. Uh, no, we that Ostia, which uh, seems to be a sort of twin uh, site uh, of Hadrian's Villa, is a harbor town. So it is a place uh, where uh, from which uh, uh, people uh, travel uh, to the rest of the Mediterranean, and uh, to which people from the uh, from the entirety of the empire arrive uh, in, into Rome. Um, also. Uh, 
Hadrian's Villa has yielded, among other things, a marble model, a miniature model of one of the uh, of the buildings of the villa, the so-called uh, garden uh, stadium. Right. So we have to imagine uh, models like this in marble, but maybe also in more uh, 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 in less heavy materials, in plaster, for example, that would be. Uh, reproduced uh, and, and would replicate or would be produced to replicate uh, uh, models that had been used for the planning of the villa uh, and then exported and spread uh, in other parts of the empire. And of course, uh, uh, you know, drawings, uh, uh, sketches, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, um, they, they, those are not extant because uh, papyri, we don't have. Uh, um, you know, the, the papyrus is, 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 mm -hmm. uh, is too fragile. And we have some architectural drawings, uh, sketches really from, from Egypt, uh, but those are uh, you know, uh, sporadic, unfortunately. I was just going to, since you said the models, I was thinking of Egypt, certainly at the Metropolitan, you have um, the tomb from the Middle Kingdom, where you have models of rooms, coming down mm -hmm. and some of the boats i think it's mechadra's tomb mm -hmm. but i may and the idea is were they used now for artists as you're suggesting could they be used by children who <laughs> want to play certainly <laughs> grandchildren um, and just i love that idea that the models could travel to different parts of the empire and educate the architects, I think that's fascinating, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which I didn't realize myself. Um, I've had a couple of questions about uh, were there different styles of Roman art the way there was with Greek art, and some uh, Jennifer asked even some of the designs, the frescoes that you showed seem almost Rococo. <laughs> That's and right. I think of Hellenistic Baroque in the sense of Rococo. Also, <laughs> you know, but uh, we've had wonderful questions. I'm sorry if we can't get to all of them because they're absolutely fascinating. No, but thank you. I mean, these are all uh, uh, you know wonderful questions, and uh, as you see, I mean, each of them uh, would uh, deserve uh, you know an uh, an hour long answer. Uh, with uh, more slides uh, to uh, we'll have the opportunity to be addressed. Uh, Francisco, it took five years, six years <laughs> since my trip in 2016, but we will get you to return and to find out more of what's being uncovered. There's such a wealth of information that you possess and this site gives us. Yeah. Right. In, in the case of uh, styles, I mean, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, one, I have a sort of, uh, provocative statement that I like to make, that in terms of uh, this cultural decoration, Hadrian's Villa is anything but original. In fact, uh, the, mm -hmm. the statues uh, that were found at the villa, and, and there are more than 200 of them that are documented, and there were probably more uh, originally, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not only are they mostly copies of Greek originals, as, uh, um, as so often uh, in, uh, in, in, in Roman art, but uh, the, the prototypes that are being chosen are not uh, particularly uh, uh, idiosyncratic ones or unique ones. I mean, uh, the, the copies that we find at Hadrian's Villa, the sculptural copies that we find at Hadrian's Villa, are the same kind of copies that we find in other imperial villas mm -hmm. as well as in senatorial uh, villas. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, uh, Hadrian is less original than uh, we usually uh, than we usually think. Where his originality or the originality of his uh, collaborator uh, is evident, uh, collaborators is evident is, I would say, the architecture and the topography. Uh, mm -hmm. So both uh, iconic uh, places that we we'll all know of, like the Serapeum, the Piazza d'Oro, and so on and so forth, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, these uh, new buildings, these more uh, utilitarian buildings, uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if you want. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, there we, we, find, uh, we find innovation also with respect to the, uh, um, 
the painted uh, and mosaic uh, decoration of the of the of the spaces. Uh, mm -hmm. There, uh, we the best parallels uh, are again in contemporary trends uh, in uh, houses in Austria, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have a team of painting specialists. Uh, the, the, the top connoisseurs of uh, Austrian painting uh, in Italy and France are collaborating with us and uh, they have been uh, uh, finding parallels uh, to, uh, to Austrian how, uh, cases uh, uh, both in patterns and in the use of uh, certain materials and certain pigments. There's so much yet to be uncovered and so much that has been discovered. I'm going to segue into a different type of question. And I thank everyone who has stayed on for this fascinating program, because I know we've taken it longer than is usually done. But there's just, as I said before, a wealth of information. Um, so now to a different type of topic. Have you, what have you learned from the non artifactual remains, such as animal bones, botanical mm. shells? Yes. Also, to segue into something entirely dissimilar. Yeah, no, that's, uh, um, uh, that's uh, uh, an, um, another fascinating aspect of, of our, of our mm -hmm. excavation. Uh, and uh, due to, uh, you know, the state of preservation of the site, uh, what we have been uh, uh, seeing uh, or what we have been uh, able to document are especially the latest phases of use uh, uh, um, uh, of, of the site with respect to, of, uh, to the presence of animals. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the fifth century, when uh, the buildings I've presented were already in a state of decay and when the ceilings had already collapsed, the painted ceilings had collapsed on the floor, we have found that uh, the area between the building, buildings uh, was used uh, uh, po possibly as a stable. Uh, they, there, are, there are troughs uh, for, uh, for uh, I mean, for, for, for animals uh, that uh, were built with reused materials. And we have been finding uh, bo uh, bones uh, of uh, pigs and, uh, and uh, bovines, uh, cows. Uh, so at some point, uh, some kind of, uh, shall we call it degradation of the usage uh, of those space uh, took place. But, this is a very late phase, uh, as I said, uh, the fifth century, the sixth century uh, CE, as far as we can see. I'm gonna ask one last question and it's hard to choose, but I wanted to end on some different types of questions. Yes. Just tell everyone who stayed on, because some of you have inquired, yes, this fascinating talk will be available on the club's website. So I think a lot of us, certainly I will be watching it a second time <laughs> and maybe even a third to get. Thank you, thank you, the kind. Um, someone asked about the clay vessels. Were they molds? Do we know about, and I'm going further, any artist workshop for potters in this vicinity? So uh, you, uh, you're talking about the, the, the bowl I showed at the end. Yes, yes, that was yes, yes. actually, uh, so they were mold made and uh, uh, in the use different stands, assembling them together uh, in different ways. I mean, uh, um, the, the, uh, sometimes in rather haphazard uh, fashions, uh, these are not uh, objects of, uh, of high value, of, of high prestige. But what is uh, interesting about them is that uh, we actually know exactly where they were made. Uh, I, I, will ha I, I will need to do archaeometric uh, analysis and so on and so forth uh, to, to see whether we can work with the type of clay. But uh, in Tunisia, the, uh, the workshops uh, where uh, these, uh, uh, these class of vessels were, were produced uh, are well known archaeologically. I mean, we know, I mean, it's not the, the workshop buildings. Uh, so, uh, uh, and there are uh, several centers in Tunisia that uh, served uh, not only uh, North Africa but uh, a great part of the of the empire. These were uh, these were vessels that were 
very popular precisely because uh, on the one hand they were nice they had figural decoration and uh, decoration with uh, content that was important to many of the users religious content mythological content but they also didn't cost much they could be uh, mechanically produced and reproduced uh, and therefore they lent themselves very well to be exported uh, uh, you know in large numbers uh, and be used uh, by uh, and be purchased uh, uh, not by uh, elite members of the imperial society uh, but by ordinary inhabitants uh, of the empire we should have as wonderful vessels today for the ordinary <laughs> members yes. of society as they did then. And it was very interesting, if I can just tie it into a talk we had recently with Jim Wright, mm -hmm. who's the uh, former president of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens. He was talking about the Port of Comos in Crete through different time periods. And then he got to the Roman period and how these ports are so important for the transference of objects, mm -hmm. the transference of knowledge all along. Um, we could go on, but I have to tell our audience that Francisco has a class to teach at Columbia in 20 minutes, or we would have continued far longer. I wanna thank you, Francisco, for this absolutely splendid lecture, as well as allowing our audience to enter your fascinating site and get to sense it in a very personal way. It's a pleasure to learn from you. That's so I thank you for that. Uh, what can I say? I mean, I, I have to thank you for inviting me in the first place, uh, for coming to Adrian's Villa. As I said, uh, one of the things uh, I enjoy most is uh, you know, uh, guiding uh, uh, visitors around the site. I, uh, you know, I, I cannot stop, to stop talking about the villa, as you might have noticed. Oh. And, uh, so uh, please come back and uh, again, thank you. And uh, thanks uh, to everybody in the audience uh, for, uh, for being here today. Okay. Our pleasure. And just a quick reminder um, for the club members only. We have an online tour of the Penn Museum in May, their African holdings. And for everyone, Betsy Bryan, who was president of the um, Amer American Research Center in Egypt, is going to be talking about Hatshepsut and the Temple of Mutt on June 17th. So to continue at high point to high point. Okay. I thank you once again, Francisco. Thank you very much.